Hello everybody, thank you so much for joining me on my channel and watching this video. Today we're going to be talking about the Texarkana Moonlight Murders and the Phantom Killer that killed five people in the town of Texarkana. To get into this video, we're going to be talking about the murders that occurred, obviously. So, trigger warning on that. There's going to be some little bit of discussions about some sexual assaults as well. So, another trigger warning for that as well. But it's not horribly gruesome today. So, I don't think I need to tell you any specific gruesome trigger warnings it it's got a little bit of something there so if you don't like hearing about that then go ahead and click off this video but like i said it's not terribly gruesome so these murders occurred in the late winter and the spring of 1946 and there was one attack and then five murders that occurred the phantom killer preyed on young couples at Lover's Lanes, and then there was a later attack after that that occurred at a home in Texarkana on the Arkansas side. So we are going to discuss all of that, and we're going to get into the stories and discuss all of the things that occurred. Alright, so the first three attacks happened on the Texas side of Texarkana, and then the last attack happened on the Arkansas side. And the first three attacks were done at Lover's Lanes on secluded areas, and then um, the last attack happened on the Arkansas side in a farmhouse. So that one was speculated that it may not be the same perpetrator that committed that crime, but they decided to lump them all together as the same perpetrator. At the time, these crimes were reported locally and nationally and eventually internationally as well. This caused panic in the town of Texarkana. People were... Given a curfew of midnight, shops were closing early. There was such a panic that stores were selling out of guns, ammunition, home locks being sold out as well, and protective gear of all kinds was also being completely sold out in stores. During this time, police were patrolling the streets a lot more than usual, and then teenagers decided to start baiting the killer by posing as young couples they were trying to get the killer to come out try to get him to attack them so they could catch the guy and police decided they were like this is dangerous why are you doing this but they eventually decided to use this to their advantage and use the teens to try to catch the guy as well because they couldn't find him but the killer was only striking on weekends the killer was called the Phantom Killer, but they also called him a sex maniac because they believed his motive was to assault the women. Many investigations were done to try to solve these crimes and to establish whether or not the last attack was connected to the other three. These investigations were local, county, and even federal investigations. So now we're going to start looking at the crimes, starting with the very first attack. This one did not include murders, but it was attempted murder. We're going to discuss what happened during this attack. So Friday night, February 22nd, 1946, at 11.45 p.m., Jimmy Hollis, who was 25, and his girlfriend, Mary Jean Larry, 19 years old, they were out at a lover's lane that was secluded, and I was reading that this was about 300 feet from the nearest neighborhood. They were out there alone, and they had only arrived 10 minutes before this had happened when a man appeared at Jimmy's window 
and shone a flashlight into his eyes. And Jimmy thought, well, that's weird. So he was like, oh, dude, you've got the wrong guy. So he tells the man, hey, you've got the wrong guy. I'm not the guy you're looking for. And the man replied, I don't want to kill you, so just do what I say. He's like, all right, we're going to comply with this guy. So he tells them to get out the driver's side door, and they both do. At which point, the man tells Jimmy to take off his pants. So he does, and as soon as he does, he hits Jimmy twice in the head with his pistol butt. He does this so hard, and it's so loud that Mary thinks that he's been shot twice. And it was just his skull fracturing. So Mary thinks that this is a robbery. So she, since she assumes that this is a robbery, she decides she's going to show the man her wallet to prove that she doesn't have any money. But that's not the motive behind this. She gets struck as well with the butt of his gun. He tells her to get up because she fell on the ground. So as soon as she gets up, she runs. And she runs to toward a ditch and he says, don't run that way, run up the road. So she does. She runs up the road and she finds an abandoned car and there's nobody inside of it. That's when the attacker confronts her again and he's like, why did you run? And she's like, because you told me to. He's like, you're a liar. He calls her a liar. After this, he assaults her sexually with the barrel of his gun. After this, she runs a half mile to the nearest house that she finds where she calls the police. Meanwhile, Jimmy is regaining consciousness and he flags down the nearest car where he gets help and goes to call the police as well. By this time, the attacker has left the area. He's long gone. Jimmy ends up having to be hospitalized for his injuries, but he does live. They end up giving conflicting statements about, about what the man looked like. Jimmy says that the man is about six feet tall, a dark-skinned white man, being about the age of 30 years old, while Mary says that the man is six feet tall and a light-skinned black man. Police, for some reason, don't believe her and say that she's just covering for somebody that she knows. I don't know why that this is, but that's just, for some reason, something that they that there are notes on is that they didn't believe her. I don't know if they didn't believe him either, but that's something I was reading about that they didn't believe her and at the time, there was a specific model flashlight that they were looking for, and they asked anybody who knew another person that owned this specific flashlight to come forward or to report the person they knew that had this type of flashlight. Alright, so now we're moving on to the first murder, and that was Sunday, March 24th, 1946. I don't know the time that this occurred. Uh, Richard Griffin, who was 29, and his girlfriend of only six weeks at the time, Polly Ann Moore, who was 17 years old. They were found dead in Richard's car. And this was found by a person who was passing by in their car. And at first, the person thought that they were sleeping. And then he later found out when he went to check on the people that they were actually dead. The reason he thought that they were sleeping was because Richard was posed like, like this. And between the front seats, he, ha he was like, I guess his... Head was like this on his knees, but he was in between the front seats of the car, which is kind of odd. And then Polly was in the back seat lying face down, kind of just like in a sleeping position. 
and they he just kind of thought that they were asleep but there was a lot of blood which gave the whole situation away the car was parked at a lover's lane it was about 100 yards south of u.s highway 67 west in texas there was a large blood stain in the grass outside of the car the blood stain that was in the grass outside the car was believed that Polly was actually killed outside the car on a blanket and then put back in the car, posed in the position that she was in. There was a blanket found at the crime scene that they concluded was the blanket that she was killed on. There was also another blanket there that they believed it was used to muffle the gun when it was being used. So they had the gun inside the blanket when they shot. So Richard was shot once in the back of the head and another time. I'm not sure where he was shot the second time. Um, but both times he was shot was inside the car. Polly was also shot once in the back of the head. We're talking about some more evidence that they found, and that is that they found congealed blood on the running board of the car as well as the car door, and they found a 32 caliber shell casing inside of a blanket that was wrapped up that they believed was the gun or was the gun muffling blanket. And then they have conflicting reports about whether or not she had been sexually assaulted. They didn't do pathology on the two bodies either. But it's later released that she was in fact sexually assaulted. Another body later on was not released to the public that she was sexually assaulted. We now know that she was in fact sexually assaulted which we will discuss that once we get to it all right so the next murder occurred on sunday april 14th and we have a specific time frame that some things occurred so at 1 30 a.m paul martin who was 17 years old picked up his girlfriend who was betty joe booker who was 15 years old, from her music performance where she was playing at the VFW and she played a saxophone, which will become important later on in the story. The VFW was located at West 4th Street and Oak Street, and that's kind of important information because of where the bodies were found. Then we have Martin's body being found at 6.30 a.m., later that same morning. He was lying on his left side. He was found on the north side of North Park Row. And the strange thing is that there was blood found on the other side of the road from where he was found. Okay, so Paul put up quite a bit of a fight because he was shot four times he was shot once through his nose once in the right hand once through the back of the neck and once through the back of his rib cage so he was either running away at one point he might have put up his hand to say like no stop he must have just been struggling a lot and police did confirm that there was a struggle between both victims between the killer and the victim they were trying to put up a fight so betty's body was found later that morning at 11 30 a.m and she was found by a search party betty was found two miles away from where paul's body was found she was behind a tree and she was fully clothed with her hand posed inside of her coat pocket this is the person i was talking about that at the time it wasn't reported that she had been raped but we now know that she was in fact raped 
Betty had been shot twice, once in the face and then once in the chest. Now, Paul's car was found about one mile from his own body and two miles away from where Betty was found. The keys were still in the car, and the car was found in Spring Lake Park. Police were unfortunately unable to discern who was killed first, Paul or Betty. They did not find the saxophone at the time that they discovered the bodies. And they were trying to figure out where it was, if somebody stole it, did the killer have it? They went looking for the saxophone for a long time, but they didn't find it for a very long time. At one point, a man did show up at like a pawn shop and he asked nervously how much he could sell a saxophone for. The police did track this guy down and he ended up having bloody clothes on him and he said the blood was his that he was in a bar fight, he didn't have the saxophone on him, so the police said that it couldn't be the guy, because he didn't have the saxophone. But they did end up finding the saxophone later in some bushes near where the bodies were found, so the police suspected that that had been placed there later. But a lot of people suspected that it had been there the whole time because when they found it, it was basically destroyed. It was rusted. The case fell apart, basically. So there's a lot of disagreement about how long it had been there. A lot of people saying that they just didn't look hard enough and that it had been there the whole time. All right. So now we are at the last attack, which is the final murder. It is at... Friday, May 3rd, 1946, at 9 p.m. And this is at the home of Virgil and Katie Starks, which is at a 500-acre farm. And this is off of Highway 57 East, 10 miles northeast of Texarkana. What happened here is that Virgil was reading the newspaper in his favorite chair, when he was suddenly shot twice from behind from a window nearby. Katie heard this broken glass and she came down because she thought that something had happened and her husband needed some help cleaning up broken glass. So she came down to see what had happened and she saw her husband stand up and then suddenly fall back down into his chair. So she realized what had happened and she got to the phone and it was only able to ring twice before she was shot from the same exact window. Even though she had been shot twice, she fell for a moment but she was able to get back up and she went to another room to try to get her gun. But unfortunately, there was so much blood on her face that she was blinded by it. Even though she was barefoot, she ran out the door because she could hear the killer trying to break in through the back door. And she ran towards her sister's house across the street. Her sister was at home, so she ran to her neighbor's house. She managed to tell them that Virgil was dead. Then she passed out. So the neighbor was able to get the other neighbor, and they got the car and took Katie to the hospital. At the hospital, Katie was questioned by police where she described everything that happened. Then the police went out to her property and they were able to find 22 caliber pistol ammo and they found the flashlight that had been used by the killer. This is one of the reasons why they aren't sure whether they are connected to the other three killings that happened because the ammo didn't match with the other ammo that were found at the other three crime scenes. They have that flashlight. So 
the flashlight's one of the things that they were looking for. But they think that this was done deliberately, maybe to throw police off of the other investigations, maybe to make it look like a copycat. And also to change a few things around, like going to a house instead of a lover's lane using a different gun. So police did have a lot of people that they interviewed and a lot of suspects, but their main suspect was a man named Yul Swinney. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his first name right, <laughs> but I hope I am. Excuse my hiccup. So a little bit of information about Yul Swinney. He was born February 9th, 1917. And he was born in Cleveland County, Arkansas, to a Baptist minister. He had a wife named Peggy, and he was a known criminal, mostly for petty crimes. Car theft and counterfeiting were his favorite things, apparently. So he had also been convicted of car theft in 1947. And he was a repeat offender, so he received a life sentence. In 1973, he was released due to habeas corpus proceeding, which found that because of a prior conviction in 41, he was not represented with counsel. So, that's some information about Swinney. Our man Swinney here just thought that would be some good information for you guys. He was linked to these crimes in Texarkana because his wife, who was apparently also his accomplice, gave descriptions to police from the murders of Paul and Benny. So, she also was able to give a lot of details about the murders. This was information that the police needed. They, they wanted this information. It was like, it was something that they didn't have before. So, they were really interested in how she knew it. Or they wanted to have her testify against him in court, but she refused to do it. And when Swinney... Sweaty hair. I, I don't know why, but his last name is fun to say. When he was arrested for what he thought was car theft, or what police were saying was car theft, he was saying, or he seemed to know, that he was being arrested for more than just car theft. Which is kind of strange, if you ask me. It's like he knew that he was guilty, or something else. He had a bit of a guilty conscience, if you ask me. There was no way to prove that what Peggy was saying was true, and they didn't have enough evidence to hold him, so they ended up having to let him go. They don't have enough physical evidence even today left for them to be able to say definitely that it was Yule or anyone else for that matter. And then Sweeney's obviously no longer alive. He passed away September 15th, 1994 in a nursing home in Dallas. Also, that the two lead detectives whose names are Max Tackett and Tillman Johnson. You don't hear names like that anymore. But anyway, they also believed that Sweeney was the guy for this crime. Till the days that they die. So there's just, I guess, like a lot of information that they might have had that we don't have that really like stuck with them that made them believe that this was the guy for the crime. So, and they even made a movie about it in 1976. It was called The Town That Dreaded Sundown. It's a nice, rhymy name. I've never seen it. I should see it. They also made a remake in 2014. I think it was on Netflix for a while. I'm not sure about that last. Don't quote me on that. But uh, I guess like every 
year they might have they have like a festival or something where they watch it and have an outdoor viewing of it or something like that which is cool i guess but like they've made this incident that occurred into something that they can now celebrate almost if that's something you can say just feel bad for the victims because they never got any like justice <laughs> i don't know like it's just it's messed up now they're celebrating that this happened but there's these victims out there that they are just lacking justice and it's kind of like they're i don't know just forgetting about the victims i guess but anyway so that's really it for the video but what do you guys think about Swinny? what do you guys think about what happened in Texarkana it's kind of crazy uh do you guys think that, he, that Swinny did it I kind of do I think that he's the guy they the one reason that like they believed that Swinny was the guy was because every night that when the murders were happening there was a car that would go missing like it would be stolen and then abandoned the next day so it would be used as like the getaway car and Swinney was a car stealer guy a car thief that's what i was looking for not car stealer guy anyway so he would be like the perfect guy for the job so He's the guy. He's got to be the guy. Like, it's too much of a coincidence. Cars go missing to commit these crimes, right? And he's the car thief. Come on, he's got to be the guy, right? Or am I just like, is it just really that big of a coincidence that these cars are going missing and the, these murders are occurring? They were being stolen to commit the crimes. So maybe he was trying to up the ante, you know? He was like, I want to steal a car and commit a murder. Or is that just me trying to have, like, conspiracy brain here? I don't know. I think, I think he's the guy. I don't know, but you guys tell me what you think. Um, am I missing something? Or do you guys think he did it? You guys think it was one of the other guys? Um, yeah, there were a lot of other guys, but I, I kind of wanted to focus on this guy. Because it seems like he's the guy. Plus, if I, if I mentioned all the other guys, the video would have gone like on for a really long time. And I didn't want it to go on that long, but... Anyway, let me know what you guys, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Let me know what your ideas are what your thoughts are and if you haven't subscribed please subscribe don't forget to share this video and don't forget to like uh, if you have subscribed thank you so much and i will see you all in the next video oh before i do that let me know what kind of video you want to see. If you want to see some certain crime or murdery type video, put it in the comments. So, yeah. Now, I will see you in the next video. Bye!